Uh, my name is Cameron Hedrick. I'm the Chief Learning Officer and Head of Performance for Citigroup. Uh, Citigroup is a big global bank, 200 plus thousand people, dozen product lines, 100 countries, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, I'd like my, 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 my friends and coworkers to introduce themselves, then I'll tell you what this is all about, so you have the option to punch out if it's something you don't want to talk about or hear about. Hi, I'm Ulrich Christensen, I'm the CEO of Area 9, and we do some of the infrastructure for a city. Uh, I'm a physician by training, so I'm a little bit on thin ice in the financial sector, but uh, I've learned, I'm, I'm a fast learner. And I'm Peter Fox, I'm responsible for digital learning and talent technology, working for Cameron, I've been at City for five years now. So that's it. There are two through lines uh, for what we'll talk about today. So this is either, you know, something you can like call a friend and say, this is going to be great, come on, or you can uh, cruise. Through line number one is uh, we'll kind of set the stage by doing this. I'll, I'll, I'll explain the sort of the strategic thesis of, uh, of our city learning group. Uh, and, and that's our really our investment thesis as well. So you'll have that uh, as a guide, and then we'll sort of overlay our learning ed tech sort of investment strategy, minus five years today and plus five years. So that's sort of through line number one. Through line number two is um, about Area 9. Uh, Area 9 and adaptive as a major part of our strategy. And the goal of this part of the, of the uh, discussion is like to show you the good and the bad and the ugly. Uh, of you know, working with a big company and what we've both learned uh, through this and, and what we anticipate going forward. So no spin, this will just be that, all right? We're gonna take a quick poll before we get into this. Uh, I just, I'm interested to know how many people are investors? I like this is a quick show of hands. Okay, very good, all right, so it's a lot of, the, this is an interesting side of the room. It's weird that you pulled up together. I don't know what that means. Right, I, oh, right, exactly. Ah, out. Uh, who, who's in like the learning? Who's a L and D specialist? Okay, good, good. Oh, wonderful, great. Um, who's like uh, ed tech startupper? It's like, okay, very good. All right, you guys might want to intersperse with these folks <laughs> over here. All right, let's start by setting the groundwork, and as I, this will take me about four or five minutes, and then I'll start stop talking. But I do think it's important to for you to understand the binding element of, of what we do structurally and investment-wise and, and, and the like uh, in, in city um, as it relates to learning. And I have a, my cheat here in case I have a senior moment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you our seven strategic the theses, uh, the plural. All right, the first and, and the one I won't forget is that uh, knowledge matters, KSAs. Uh, it's, for us, it's not a nice to have. We really feel like uh, it's a competitive advantage, one of the few competitive advantages that are left and durable. And so just like we want to manage real estate or stock portfolios or banking relationships, well, we want to manage this asset well. That's an important head space to be in. Um, number two, um, we uh, realize that people don't want learning. <laughs> they want some other outcome. Right? They want success, they want proficiency, they want promotion. It's a sort of, a, and, and it sounds so obvious, but when you really view it through that lens, sort of this Levitt, Christensen, jobs to be done lens, for those of you that are familiar with that, it changes the way you market and produce product. All right, so that's number two. Number three, um, successful behavior change sustained is a, is a product of a harmonized system. Learning as a point, uh, training as a point solution rarely works. So we look at all the things that influence behavior and sort of work on that as a portfolio. And then as it relates to development itself, we do really employ that 70, 20, 10. We call it the three E's. There needs to be an education component, an exposure component, and some kind of experiential component, which might be a new job, it might be a temporary project, but the sum of those things create the conditions for uh, better development. Uh, number four of seven. Yeah, and this uh, sometimes upsets people. Democratization is a good thing, and it matters a lot. But absent some kind of contextualization machine or process or strategy, it's just a lot. You can't really realize the value on it. So, you know, it's a lot of assets, but you don't get the, you know, the, the yield from it. And that is not easy to do, as you guys know better than anybody. 
uh, five of seven. Data's important, skills data's important. This is fairly new for us. We've been at this for two and a half years, but identification, codification, and analyzation of the individual and aggregate skills portfolio is what we're going after. All right, six of seven. Um, multiple learning mode capability, right? Um, so there are really six conditions that we try to solve for or all the combinations thereof. And they are, uh, you're alone or you're together. <laughs> it's real time or asynchronous, proximate or distant, and any configuration of those six. And then finally, um, uh, uh, this is the other thing that sometimes people don't like. I, I'm, I'm not a big, like, four or five stage Kirkpatrick guy. Um, I think the juice isn't worth the squeeze at the latter end of that. Uh, but we are very serious about uh, landing readiness and making sure that there's a readiness quotient for our folks. Uh, and that's really where we spend a lot of our time and money on evaluation. So that's that. So that's the foundation. And against that, we'd like to give you a quick snapshot of where we were <laughs> and where we're headed uh, from an ad tech standpoint. Thanks, Cameron. Um, so just to be really transparent about our journey, about five years ago when, uh, well, six years when you took over CLO, five years ago when I joined, uh, City had spent a lot of time just with a single LMS that they had highly customised. We didn't have any type of design standards around any form of digital learning that we'd put out to people. People could use whatever tool, whatever vendor, whatever they wanted. It led to a really... Um, disparate user experience. It, it led to a lot of complaints because our tech didn't quite work. People spending all this time, as you can imagine, in a heavily regulated environment like us, a lot of compliance training and it didn't work. You're spending hours and hours and things aren't tracking correctly. It was really, even though it was five years ago, it was probably 10 years ago from a design standard, the types of things that we were having. We hadn't even updated our LMS for I think it was about seven years at that point in time because prior to that, we'd spent so long customising. We came from a, hey, just build it, customise it, get it out there. We just have to get the message out there approach. And about five years ago, we started to take a very clear strategic uh, approach to not building anymore and starting to buy. Like, like a lot of big companies like us, there's nothing unique about what we did there. But it was a big shift because... Now, if you want something, you don't just have to try and figure out how to hack the code together on something that you have. You have to look out and, and bring in some of the best-in-class tools. And, and the, the first licensed piece that we did for that was to bring in Degreed, the learning experience platform. We were one of their early, early clients and still one of, their, one of their main clients and advocates. Uh, and we placed that above the, the LMS. And we, we made that the gateway into things, but we didn't mandate it. We didn't force everyone into our LXP. We still allowed people to access learning how they had in the past. The next step that we did was we started to consolidate the types of tools people could develop in and the types of partners that people could use. So we didn't just let everyone go out and start licensing new libraries or, or hey, I met someone at the ASU conference and they've got this great course on anti-harassment, so we'll use them, we'll put it in. We started to create standards to create a more consistent user experience for everyone in the bank, you know? Remove some of the friction around how the heck do I get to this? Does it work? How do I use it? And start to focus on actually bringing in some quality content, um, which is harder than what you think in a 200,000 person company where you have hundreds of people around the world in learning roles, going out sourcing and doing these things. It was, it's a huge culture shift that we had to go through. Um, then a couple of years ago, we went out into the marketplace to start to figure out uh, what, how we could get more personalised in our learning approach. So if you thought the LXP brought in a level of personalisation around accessing the libraries and the content we had, what we wanted to do is get to a level of personalisation where each individual learning experience gets customised, uh, gets personalised, is based on what you know rather than just what we want to tell you. And that's where we ended up, we recessed quite a few companies, but ended up landing on Area 9 as the organisation that we've chosen to partner with and take that forward. Um, so that's where we're at right now. So we're at this moment in time where we are going to have a much more individual personalised learning experience. And moving ahead, so if we try and project, and we'll, we'll get into more of this when I throw over to Ulrich, but moving ahead, we, we know that we're still, we've still got a long way to go on this journey. Uh, the things that I'm talking about are still a go-to and do performance initiative, go-to and do learning initiative. We know that we've got to get 
to the flow of work, but we're taking these conscious steps of incrementally getting better, getting a more consistent experience, trying to reduce the amount of libraries and overlap that we have in things. That's one of the biggest challenges that the LXP has brought to our organisation is we've got some great partnerships with companies like Udemy and Intuition and several other libraries that we use. That actually complicates the process even further. So we're working through all of that now to try and um, get a bit more of a refined and easier approach for people accessing our learning. But that's sort of the background as to where we are and how we got to Ulrich. So, on the journey to uh, start of solving for uh, some of what I outlined up front and what Peter talked about, we came across Area 9. And, um, well, I tell you what, one thing, and I, you, you, I know about this much relative to you, but this term adaptive learning has been really, people take a lot of liberty with that term. <laughs> so why don't you tell us what that means to you and how Area 9 serves that up? Yeah, so that's it is actually quite a fun, quite funny. A, a company that doesn't exist anymore, I think. Uh, at some point, we were trying to see if we could put some nuances into this because adaptive learning could be an old like you mailed in your exercises every week and you got a different one back. That's adaptivity with an adapt ad adaptation rate of like once every two weeks. Um, adaptive learning works when you get a, a adaptation over a certain threshold. And a good example is you probably remember at a certain point you got your first GPS. And a GPS actually worked before that. The satellites were there. The problem was that the resolution for which it could tell you reliably when to turn was not there because it was considered military grade technology. When they then moved it from being, I think, 30 meters to 10 meters, uh, suddenly it became useful because now it could tell you when to turn. That's the same thing with, ad with ad adaptivity. So it's not the concept of adaptivity that you're adjusting it based on the individual. It's much more a matter of what is the resolution and what is the quality of what is happening in each of these interactions. So in my old world as a physician, like, you probably do not want the average of the prescriptions from the last 10 patients to go home with that, right? <laughs> that, that's pretty horrible, right? So what, you, what we are expecting in healthcare is you're actually expecting that the physician seriously diagnoses you, only you, carefully you, and is knowledgeable enough to provide something in qu of quality as part of, that, as part of that interaction. And that's the concept we brought to, to education. And one of the things we found was, I'm actually not particularly interested in knowledge, ironically enough, having, having built like, I don't know, thousands of products also in higher ed where it's 100% knowledge, but it was, it was an outcome of understanding what actually leads to real performance in the real life. Uh, and what more importantly leads to the errors that in my old well in, in healthcare or with pilots or with astronauts or other high performance, high reliability situations, what, what is the role of knowledge there? And often that is the thing that leads to cognitive overload. The fact that we're trying to learn so much that when we actually need to so problem solve and use it for something real, it doesn't work. And that's why we ended up working, trying to figure out, could we optimize how you actually learn things in the first place so that it was more accessible and useful later? Could you shorten the amount of time it takes to get to proficiency? Can you shorten the amount of time it takes to stay proficient? And the, and the best way to do that is actually to use a personalization approach instead of a one size fits many or some would say nobody. Um, and, and the big impact of, of that is that you actually begin to see that the number one problem in learning that we found looking at like tens of millions of learners over the last years in very various domains is that the pace by which you learn and by the, pay, the time it takes for you to get to full proficiency varies a lot more than we thought. It's an order of magnitude. It's like what normally is covered in 45 minutes, the fastest can typically get through it in 12. The slowest, even not the extreme slowest, but the, like within reason slowest, to still get to full proficiency needs two hours. So it's from 12 minutes to two hours, no education systems are geared to handle that. And what that means in the context and, and what adaptivity there means is, can, could, if we can just adapt to one thing, we adapt to many different things, but just adapting to the pace by which people learn is a big, big improvement in order not to lose a very significant part of the people who have the potential of eventually becoming fully proficient and succeeding in their lives. That. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a disclaimer that nobody says, uh, you know, because we do, all, like many of you, you probably speak all these places, and it's really easy for me to get up and talk about strategy and all this. This shit is hard. <laughs> it is a slog. It is slow. 
That's going to be the backbone of the next 24 minutes, where I'm going to just use Area 9 as a proxy for implementing things and getting them through. But uh, And particularly when, like many of you, when you're on the edge, you're starting like you're either defining the edge or you're just a little bit behind it, you know, you, it's extra hard. That's the fun place to be, but boy, it's exponentially more difficult. So, um, so, here, so here we are. Let, let's talk about this, perhaps, um, from both of, 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 of your standpoints, and I'll, I'll sort of play ball in the middle. What, what's been the biggest surprise, I'll start with you, when you started to work with us? I don't know if we're a proxy for the Fortune 50, but we're certainly a proxy for complexity. So what, <laughs> what do you think about that? Yeah. So uh, I see several familiar faces here who knows that I've spent uh, 20, 25 years understanding unconscious incompetence. And I, <laughs> I, I testify to the fact that we were unconsciously incompetent here. We did not know how hard it was to work with a bank. And, and we've worked with defense forces, we've worked with more, like we've worked in healthcare with pharmaceutical companies, and we, 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 uh, we learned it the hard way. But having said that, um, unconscious incompetence and actually quickly realizing that there is something, there's a gap you need to close, is actually the other big areas where if you can adapt to that, you learn a lot faster. Um, so one of the things we did early was that uh, Peter promised me that if there's anything with city that was city specific and not something where we felt like this was solving a more general problem. Meaning actually as a partner committing to the fact that if we were willing to go through this learning process, he would reciprocate that by saying, we're not going to pull, make you jump through some hoops that are just for city. So let's make that agreement early. And, and I have, I, I taught the craftsmanship of, uh, I learned the, um, the uh, crafts of partnerships from one of my first mentors 20 years ago, American Heart Association in Little. And this thing where if you can really establish these deep partnerships where you truly are not a vendor with, and, and, uh, and a buyer, um, but ending up in a situation like this, it makes it a lot easier when you, like we had a programmer quit. Uh, our, actually our best programmer, a brilliant woman, quit because she couldn't stand city. She couldn't stand more of these ridiculous Him in requests. particular. And um, I did ask permission to share the story. <laughs> Um, so I need to send her partners. flowers or something. So we, uh, well, we did. We, we bribed her with a visa to Denmark, and uh, we promised that she would never have to work on City again, as long as she finished her current job. <laughs> so, and she's still here. So, but, but, the, <laughs> but, but the, the situation is, like, it, it, is, it can be really hard. If, like, to, it's, two, it's two cultures. Like, we are, we, I think we're, by many, are called hyper-agile, or, like, the most extreme version of agile, which is completely incompatible at least at first sight with the way a bank sees the world. So how do you then become prepared for this? And, 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 and we're not that crazy. We work, we do on-site installations with defense forces. Like, it's not like we are so crazy that you can, we can only do like the local knitting club. But, but there is just a big difference. And one of the things, I, I, I've, at some point, I, our CTO seriously suggested that we disable the keyboard. Like, seriously? I said, uh, come on, don't, don't be fastidious. Like, let's, be, let's come back and be, be serious here. He says, no, I get it. Like, I probably know how to use an input field and a fill in the blank question as an attack vector to hack their system. So I get why they're worried. So for us, it was also an advantage. Like, uh, I went to school with one of the guys who hacked Pentagon in 1990. Um, so these guys are good. And that's also why, if you realize, and he's not part of the company, by the way. Um, so, um, but but the, but the reality is that, that you, with banks, because you're suddenly working in an environment where defense is nothing compared to the attacks that these guys are under, and trying to then learn how to deal with it at that level, just moves it from being like, you can be a startup of 10 people, probably you shouldn't work with a bank. If you're, if you're uh, in the, build, uh, the equivalent of making an airport or building a, a large bridge or something, that's more like what it feels like working with a bank. But that doesn't mean that either of us are wrong. It just means that it's something where you relatively quickly should begin to tackle those things. I think that the, uh, the safety and soundness for a bank is one of our most important things. So whilst we drive really hard to innovate and obviously want to and we know we need to be adapting and, and innovating in what we do, we always have to think about the safety and soundness of our organisation, of our clients. Um, so that's where we, we do have way more rigorous controls than other people. And, and, on, and on the topic of safety and centers, just to take one step back to how we actually selected the Area 9 in the first place and the hypotheses we had, we came at the whole adaptive space thinking, 
it's going to save us some money. We've got so many people, we've got so many hourly workers, like maybe 80,000 people that are on an hourly salary. With all the learning that we have to deliver, if we can save 30% of 80,000 people, like this thing pays for itself a thousand times over. But that didn't actually become, once we got into this, it didn't actually become the important point. The thing that Bullock was talking about, the uncovering the unconscious incompetence in our organisation is actually where the real value is going to come because that then leads back to the safety and soundness of our organisation again. Everyone says learning will fix it, someone did something wrong. Well, there's bad actors that can actually make their way into any organisation and we can build whatever controls we have around that but that's not always going to be how you can solve things because mistakes can still happen by people that aren't bad actors. And they're typically people that think they know what they're doing and don't. So that's where part of the value of this platform, why we really landed on it in the end as the, the one to partner with um, came to the front. And the other thing I probably should say, because we didn't say this up front, City are not investors in Area 9 either. So this is really unusual for us to sit on the stage with someone that's a partner. We are not investors, so we don't have any financial skin in the game of promoting that. So I do want to share that here because I know that we do invest as our venture arm invests in a lot of the ed tech, some of the folks that are here right now, but we're not investors in Area 9, but uh, we're bullish about the value that it can add to our organisation. I should speak to a little bit, since we talked about the run-up to, to selecting you. Uh, first, I do want to underscore something Peter said. We really thought this would be a cost play. In our own internal pilots, on average, we saved around 15 to 18% of, of time with this approach. And the recall rates, right, the forget, forgetting curve benefits were remarkable. So that times millions and millions and millions and millions of training hours. Uh, I thought it'd be compelling to our CFO, but you know, he says to me, "Well, yes. So, but it's not a closed system. So th th that those minutes get saved. That's wonderful, but they're diffused. So you can't really count that in your business case, which is a real kick in the butt." <laughs> I I thought it was really smart, but 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 the but the thing that I cannot un uh, over uh, I just imagine this, and I mean this literally, and and it'll this will happen before long for me to be able to say to uh, our CEO, our, our management team, that uh, we've been able to diagnose that we have an um, unconscious un incompetence problem in um, Singapore retail or in a particular uh, functional role type. You know, tellers or, or investment bankers seem to have a soft spot here and they don't even recognize it. The, the way we can respond to that is we, do, we can't see any of that today. We can't see it. Uh, so this gives us an opportunity to, again, manage our, our KSA portfolio in a way that just doesn't have a precedent at this scale that I know of. Uh, you probably do. So, so one of the things that was remarkable the first time we had the discussion, because we were, I was somewhat con uh, consciously um, incompetent about banks. We, we had spoken to a lot of them at that point, and, and the reality was that before we met the first time, um, I had not met a bank that was truly interested in making learning work. I've met lots of banks who are interested in being compliant. And that's, that could be two different, very, very different things, right? So I challenged Cameron and I said, so you probably don't really want your compliance training to work. You just need the deniability. And he looked at me and said, no, I want to be the first CLO who fundamentally changes this problem. What do I need to do? Um, and the discussion we had was there's probably a culture change around how do, how do you invest in your own training? Do you see this as something where you go buy it from somewhere else and then it's out of the way? Um, or is this something you see as important as when you move, when a company moves to lean and educates 100 Six Sigma Black Bells who are the internal change agents, you change your processes, you do all these things where you begin to use your production, something as, as boring as your production's efficiency as a competitive edge or competitive advantage. And, and it's actually really clear for, for me now, some years later after we met, that there is a simple correlation, and for the edtech companies in the room, this is this this took me a few years to figure out. But it's, it, there is one parameter that is important, which is where does where does the CLO and where does the decision maker for this belong in the organization? Is this somebody who reports to strategic leadership, or is this a staff function that is an afterthought or something that just needs to be there? Like whatever towels you have in the bathroom doesn't really matter, but they need to be there, right? And and if you if you can get to that, if you can narrow that gap, or if you can see that there is a narrow gap between strategic leadership and this, so that it, it often happens, like we, we've tried to make this argument many times, and we can cut the initial training time down dramatically, but in most cases, it's not really appreciated. 
Whereas if you can change the competitive ability of the staff in a, in a systematic way, so all the money that is invested in city-specific training, I don't know how many, you're probably going to have hundreds or hundreds soon of people who knows how to change the way city develops education, then it's a, then it's a systemic change. And I think that was one of the things that for, for me, and uh, going through people quitting because they think this is hard, but it's okay that it's hard, right? As long as you can see that there is a purpose within. You should know that before I engage with any uh, partner, I tell them, you don't want us. <laughs> like you think you yeah. do, yeah. <laughs> but you don't. Oh, no, no, we, we're excited to work with you. And then people start quitting and crying. <laughs> but I, but we, it's, we it's truth, in, uh, truth in lending and it's a truth in partnership. The, um, I know there's not many learning professionals in the room, but one of the other internal barriers that we faced even before signing as part of trying to build the business case was that it's not easy to build in a tool like Area 9, right? You can't, it's not just a rapid garbage in, garbage out platform, which people are used to. And we would, we, we would get arguments back, well, as a full-time instructional designer here, it's going to take me three times as long to build this course as what it would on traditional platforms like Articulate Lectura or whatever. Um, and, and that was the mindset we started from. We would have individuals in the bank building a course for 200,000 people that were concerned that the first build might take them five or six more weeks to do even though the benefit to 199,999 people is sitting there. So th there's a lot of these types of things that we've had to work to, and you'd be amazed that at every step, people weren't ready to, ready to be the person, okay, I will learn this, I will. So th that when we talk about the proliferation of our content and what we're doing there as well, Cameron has been really conscious w w with me too around, it's okay if, you, if the, the platforms and things that we bring in are difficult for the developers, the people creating the source content to use. As long as it's easy for the end user, the hundreds of thousands of people we're hitting, that's actually what we care about. We're happy to overinvest time and upskill people to be professional engineers because that helps us in the bigger game. So let's continue on with this change management theme because this is a fun one. So uh, that was a good one. Here's another one, okay, because we have to be honest with ourselves. Most people, particularly when they're doing like compliance training, let's just pick on that because that's fun. They just want to like turn on Netflix in the background and just click through and just until they get to register. And they'll take, you know, they'll take a whack at the knowledge check at the end and probably get through it. They're going to hate this because um, if that's their goal, like to be passive, it doesn't work. <laughs> so you have to actively engage with this. And that's part of our change management component. Peter mentioned the developers. In fact, we, we launched our inaugural learning engineer class yesterday for this. This is really exciting times. Uh, but but I'm, I'm worried about how I'm going to talk about this to our regulators. I'm worried about how I'm going to talk about this to people who say, well, I have to actually like be engaged in this event. I just can't click through. Uh, I look forward to those conversations because they are necessary, but those are some other change management factors that need to be thought through. And, and they're tough. The, the main reason why most banks don't want to do that is by, by deciding what do I ask people to learn, you're also making an active decision about what you're down prioritizing, and you need to be able to make that argument. But the reality is that a lot of compliance training, as we've seen it, is check the box learning. It's something where there's no validation that it really works. Anybody from the airline industry? Good. Then I'll tell you a story that shouldn't leave the room. Uh, don't broadcast it. So, so uh, uh, some, of, some of the major training for pilots, there is a commercial program you, that the pilots buy for their own money that basically clicks next. And then they start it Saturday morning and it runs for a weekend, and then they're done with this. They never look at it. This really happens in certain parts of commercial aviation. It's pretty nuts that you have that you have this situation. Why does it happen? It's because the the way this learning is made in the first place feels completely relevant for the people taking it. Because these pilots will die when the plane crashes. So pilots are typically the first ones to look for as as a as a as the canary in the mine for when when is there a problem, and there and there's definitely something wrong with that picture. And that's why, if somebody comes to us and says. We, we can't use your platform because the learning engineering takes too much time. It's like, that's fine. Then, but, but probably you don't want to solve a hard problem then because you, don't, you, you cannot have a quick way in two weeks and design an F, F35. We all know that, right? 
But why do we believe that learning needs to be easy? Why do we think that we can make mass producible learning easily? It makes no sense. Like, it's hard to use AutoCAD. Is every single building in the Western world drawn in AutoCAD today? Of course. But it's not that easy. None of us can probably use AutoCAD. But if you're a serious architect, you, you have to work with AutoCAD. And that's, the, that's one of the things that is having spent the last 25 years in this. I'm, I'm really surprised that we're still having these debates. Like, why isn't it quick and easy? It's like, because it's a hard problem. And that's why it's, of course, interesting to then go through that pain. And, and as like, leading up to the launch of that course here, we were basically having city demanding a certain number of additional checks for every step of the way teaching these, these uh, learning engineers. And eventually we said, okay, let's do it. But if it gets too slow, if you're running into these things, then, then probably we should revisit it. The good news, and which is encouraging, was that when we let go, and we didn't say they have to do it our way, we said, okay, let's try it your way, before they actually launched it, they removed that series of checks. And because they understood the logic of what we were trying to say and why it would slow it down. But, but it is something where it is really hard. It will be thousands of hours that you guys will invest in it. But, and that's why um, I, I do think that there will be a bifurcation of where education is going. That will be quick and dirty, like the, the, the stuff that you find on, on TV shop, but that it will do everything for everybody, even fix your marital crisis. Or there will be the autocats and the people and the architects of the world saying, we're scientists, we're architects, we're engineers, we're seriously working on solving hard problems one step at a time, but we also accept that, the, that it requires an investment. And over time, this, the C-suite, like the people um, above the CLO, will realize we have to invest in this, like we're, they're paying millions or hundreds of millions of dollars for the new CRM system or the new uh, accounting system, the ERP systems. Why the heck do we look at, it only costs like a million bucks to fix the education thing, which might actually be a lot harder than doing ledgers. We want to leave a little time for questions, so be thinking about that. But uh, can you just spend 30 seconds talking about this horse for the course, like the, our segmented development strategy? Like oh, yes, yes. So how we're broken down, it, and I'm, I'm just talking about, so what Cameron said at the start about the six different ways of delivering training. I'm just talking about the one-to-one -one traditional digital learning approach, okay? So we're not talking about cohort-based learning. We work with Nomadic. We use several other different cohort-based tools. But just for the one-to-one -one piece, as we consolidate down to help make the user experience better, help get better data out, we've gone down a three-path strategy. So area nine is what we're going to use for our high, higher-end one-to-one digital learning, okay? The, the fully adaptive process. We have BrainShark for our rapid, get it out there, convert a PowerPoint, do a quick message, quick comms piece, really, essentially, at the bottom. And then in the middle, uh, we're, we're just about to sign the contract, so I can't say what it is, but in the middle, we've, we've got a, 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 what I would call a first class LCMS type product that people will build into for what will probably, I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing this now, I think it'll probably be 50% of the training content will still exist in there and then probably 30% will be in Area 9, and hopefully the, the rapid stuff will get less and less down to 20% or more. Because if you're just putting a PowerPoint and publishing it on something like BrainShark, and it can probably be a PDF, it can probably be an email, it can probably be any one of a number of things versus the, this idea that we've got to be able to rapidly produce something quickly. Is that what you want me to address? Yeah, okay, perfect. Good. All right. All right, so that's it. That's foundation stuff. What questions do you have? We luckily do a, we do luckily do a lot for aviation, so they are getting better. <laughs> Yeah, well, we've got people that are dedicated developers. So there is a lot of full-time developers in the organization. I think there's about 40 or 50 across city. So they're just going to have a slower output initially 
while they're creating this content. We're about to do a, a whole overhaul of our risk management approach across the whole bank as well, and we're building out a full data academy. And both of those pieces, whilst they're going to take longer to stand up, building it in Area 9, um, and we may not be able to upskill every learning designer, but if we don't, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that process as it comes. There are other places that you can be good at delivering learning, but I don't believe everyone's going to become a top-end engineer in Area 9. The, the other thing I would say, it's an excellent question. Um, I understood enough financially to move in this direction, but I knew we'd have to iterate. I mean, after this first class and seeing what the actual development hours are and how many courses we want to route through this, the math will start to tell different stories, and I'll, I have an oh shit moment every day, and I'm sure this will prompt more. So I think, I think the good news for the it take people in the room is that it often coincides that the customers that are as uh, complex or where the initial investment is as big, they often are aware of this problem. They used to change management, they're very serious about it, um, and, and they resource it appropriately. So that applies to the defense, that applies to large government contracts, things like that. The other part is completely the opposite, where you try to start with smaller projects that you then grow internally. But the good news there is that you often have the fire souls who are willing to put that investment in there because they want to prove their case. So, so it's, it's not as bad as it could sound, where you constantly end up in a situation where you, you have to get over an enormous hump, otherwise you can't move at all. Um, so. Yeah. Yes. Oof, this is a big topic, right? Because it's sort of to get at the root of that and have to talk about where we think that whole space is going. Uh, simply put, right, but this is grossly oversimplified, I apologize. Uh, we believe like the unit of competence and proving is going is down, you know, down in time, being more focused, less BAs, less MBAs in general. Um, we've invested in, in some of, of that work already. Um, we think that credentialing and proving readiness for very specific role types is kind of the way forward. I, I that, that's about as, as far as I could go on that. I don't think so. Uh, you know, I don't. Yeah. Uh, that is a massive piece of work that we're doing right now, right? Right now, in, we have certain multi-incumbent roles that have s skill profiles and uh, self and manager assessments in pockets, but it's very limited. So what you're talking about is, is, what we're, is where we're moving next, like skill profiles for all relevant roles, inventories for every human, uh, capability assessments relative to those roles, for every human in the role, and then our, our ability to sort of look at that from a, a data standpoint. When you look at what it takes to do that, uh, we're a workday shop, so that's a big deal. <laughs> 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 the install base matters. <laughs> Uh, we have to do, I mean, you should see the tech architecture diagram for this thing. It looks very complicated, but we are, we are going exactly where you're talking about. We're, we're a little base away from that. And I'll ask the next year, Scott. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There, there, there is another dimension there as well that as a global bank, we also need to consider what is learning and performance support and how are people going to use that data. So we have it. Uh, 
let's, let's, let's pick on Germany uh, and the Works Council only for the reasons that, that it, for right reasons, it really protects its employees in a great way. But that means that learning cannot be used for any type of performance measurement in places like that. Okay, so we this all this data that we're getting an insight to, particularly the area nine stuff, managers will not see the detail. Cameron will not know how stupid I am on certain courses. He will not be able to do that. But the course owners will be able to roll that stuff on aggregate. So there's a couple of ways that we have to address that. Now, where you could start to get real value is where if we were, and this is where we hopefully will go in a few years' time, when you're really skimming my whole footprint in the organisation and tying it through. But that, that I'm glad you asked that question because we can see that but it's so hard as a global, highly regulated organisation that has to treat every country and go through this to, to stand that up. So we consciously take incremental steps in that direction. I'm getting the hook, I'm sorry. But so, you know, look, at the end of the day, uh, with adaptive and skills, we're just, right now, we're just cutting dirt roads. That's the, that's the plan. And eventually we'll pave them and we'll widen them. Uh, but we have to start drilling through the mountain and that's kind of where we're at right now so i look forward maybe to seeing you next year so we can tell you more about our struggle thank you guys for coming Thanks it means everyone. a lot to us